This week on CrossFeed. When was Jesus really born? The Vatican and bioethics. Is Santa Satan? Sanctuary! And the Virgin Mary poses with Playboy? Welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Hey, I'm Pat. That's Jim Butler out here in Snow Central of uh, Boston, where we've gotten 18 inches of snow over the past two days. I was wondering if you'd have electricity. I heard a lot of people are out of it. Now, that's out in the central and western part of the state. We're okay out here. In that's Boston. good. Makes it easier for podcasting anyway. <laughs> Priorities, you know. <laughs> well, we had to cancel services today because our roads were, we got blizzards and temperatures down, you know, uh, wind chills negative 35 and, you know, and that. And it kind of an older congregation to begin with. And so most of them probably wouldn't have come. But for the ones that would have just out of a sense of obligation, um, <laughs> for their safety, we had to uh, call it off. Um, but I did, since I had my sermon written already, what I did is I just used this headset and, uh, and used my podcasting equipment and just recorded the sermon and then, uh, posted it up on our church website, uh, with, with, I podcast it anyway. And, um, so I just recorded it that way and posted it up and sent out an email to everybody from the church that I have email addresses for and said, uh, no service today, but you can still listen to the sermon. Just, you know, click this link. And so I don't know if anybody did, but it was there. Aren't you wired? Online? Surfing the web? Good. HTML, good buddy. And we had services. We had our children's program, but our attendance was down. But coming back, I um, we live on a hill, and our driveway is even steeper hill coming up. And uh, I couldn't make it up the hill to the road. And uh, a couple of guys helped push me. So I got up here. And uh, no way I was going to make it up the driveway. So I just parked at the bottom. <laughs> and then I cleaned off the the, the, the whole... I got the driveway cleaned off so I get my get the car up. And then my wife went shopping at church. And <laughs> she got stuck down at the bottom of the hill too. So we had to take our snowblower and actually... Uh, um, make a path for her to drive up so she could get up to the house. The other day, my daughter spent two and a half hours shoveling, and she was really wishing that we had a snowblower, but we don't. So, <laughs> and, well, when and you she get, only shoveled half our walk, too. Yeah, well, when six to 12 inches of snow is pretty typical out here, you have to have one. Yeah. Yeah. This, this you know, last year was really bad, and this year's looking like it's going to be the same. You know, like global warming. And, uh, yep. well, so up to this point, we haven't really needed it. It's been kind of wimpy. You know, we moved down here from Wisconsin seven years ago and it was kind of like, this is winter. This isn't winter, you know, and, uh, <laughs> this is winter. <laughs> That's for sure. <clears throat> yep. So no, we, we had a, um, uh, now, up here, we're used to, um, one year we got 120 inches of snow. So, uh, that was the year we decided we better buy it. It was, it was not that winter, it was either that winter or the winter after that we bought the, the snowblower. And, uh, so we've been needing that ever since because I'll tell you what, it takes a heck of a lot to go out there and shovel that sucker. You know who's so, uh, really having problems in Iowa with the snow? The people from Mexico that have come in here illegally, they're not used to all this snow. Oh, man. <laughs> listen, listen to that. You decided it's time for us to get going. Did you hear that? There we are. There's a picture of the vigil that they're holding. Oh, man. It's kind of choppy tonight. Our audio is good, but our, uh, our video is kind of coming and going. So look closely. It kind of comes and goes. Anyway. Um, for anybody that hasn't heard it, man, I have heard quite enough of it. Um, 
happy to be, <laughs> I'll talk about it instead of listening to it for a change because <laughs> it's been all over the news for months. Um, and that is Postville, Iowa. Um, <clears throat> what Postville is best known for uh, is it has the most Jews per capita of any, I believe it's any Iowa city because there's a big kosher meat pro- uh, processing plant and it employs a whole ton of rabbis uh, to uh, to bless all of the meat and make sure that it's being processed properly so that it's all kosher. But they don't just have Jews there. Uh, they've got a lot of uh, uh, Hispanics who, as it turns out, are illegal aliens or illegal immigrants or whatever the uh, proper term is nowadays. And uh, so... Uh, I don't know. Did you guys hear about this out in Massachusetts? No? Well, we've had our own excitement with this, but no, we haven't heard about the Iowa excitement. Okay. Well, it was the largest uh, immigration raid in U.S. history. And so apparently all of these people who are now have been um, persecuted and not able to work because they're not legal, they don't have visas, um, they are living in churches around Postville. And the churches, through charitable donations and whatnot, are taking care of all these people. They're all sleeping in the churches. And the churches are saying, hey, this poor, or this, this evil, nasty government, it, it's uh, turning immigration into all politics. And, um, and, and they really need to be nice to all these people and, and consider it because now they won't let these people work. I, I'm not even sure why they're still here. I guess they haven't gotten around to uh, all the trials or um, all the deportation proceedings or, or whatever. Um, but, all right, I mean, this really frustrates me because, uh, you know, people are having a hard time finding jobs nowadays. Um, they're really, um, they're, there's just not many out there. Uh, even if you're looking for like a minimum wage job, and that's what we're talking about here. These are uh, basically minimum wage jobs, um, or very low paying anyway, and um, working in agro-processing. Um, it's a you know, factory work. And th- the American citizens can't get jobs because people have come into the country illegally and uh, and taken those jobs. Mm-hmm. And so the government steps in and says, hold on a minute here. Uh, you need to go through the proper channels before you come in here. Uh, the the company shouldn't have hired you in the first place, and um, so you can't work there anymore because you shouldn't have to begin with. Mm-hmm. And so now they're saying, oh, big bad government, step in it. Yes, I know. It's amazing how the weather, how the... Uh, um it's it's the government that's that's at fault here, not uh, the people who are, you know, here illegally. Um, I mean, you know, it's kind of frustrating, and you know, we need to be, I think, um, caring, all those kind of things here. But yeah, there is a certain problem when you know you're here <laughs> illegally. <laughs> You know, we have, I, I love this quote, all right, because they talked to a bunch of pastors from the area uh, that are housing these people. Certainly the scripture tells us God does not look at people as legal or illegal, but simply as children of God. All right, I got Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. I don't remember legal or illegal. Now, I mean, don't get me wrong. God loves all these people. Jesus died for all these people. These people are all of infinite value. At the same time, the Bible tells us that we need to obey the laws of the government unless they go against uh, Scripture. And we're not doing anybody any favors by allowing them to sneak into the country and to to live like this and to, you know, to, to raise their children to say, well... You do what you gotta when you gotta, and um, if you gotta break a few laws along the way to get the most out of life, then do it. 
I, I, I personally like the, this um, Lutheran pastor, Steve Brackett, who says, It's ridiculous to expect the church to bear the brunt of the humanitarian need following the raid. Well, nobody's expecting you to. No. <laughs> You're kind of choosing to do this. Yeah, the only people expecting that are the people, the the uh, the illegal immigrants, <laughs> and uh, yeah. they have no right to expect that. You know, you broke the law. Period. You know, you've got no right to be. You know, I know lots of people that have gone through all the hoops that you need to go through to come into this country. All right, and to uh, whether it be for a visa or whether it be for citizenship, and it can be done. And yeah, there's a lot of red tape. It's a big pain. All right. But what are we saying to those people that have done it all legally when other people just sneak across the border and we say, yeah, come on in. Oh, you're legal? Oh, well, well, you're here. So finders keepers, I guess, or something like that. You know, I'm sorry, but you just can't run a society that way. All right. Also, interesting enough, by the way, the LCMS Board for Human Care was more, kind of leans more towards an open um, immigration policy, um, that, which they came out last summer. It, it, it's it's a very frustrating thing. I do want to talk about, you know, it's it's to write there that they are right. It's just not legal and illegal. It's very difficult in some of these situations, and they are coming here uh, because, you know, t- this this is the great land. I mean, they, they're looking and going. This is I, I can I can do it there I can make it make make it there things will be different there I mean you know they're they're coming because of what really we like about this country the most so you know it's kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a frustrating thing yeah you know they're here legally but they're here kind of for the right reason because they know that here they can you know change and make a difference in their lives. Well, it's certainly when people, you know, complain about how horrible America is, you know, I would say there's two kinds of countries. There's countries that people are trying to get into and countries people are trying to get out of, you know, when your country has immigration problems, that you got too many people coming in, that says something positive about your country. When people are trying to escape, that says something negative, you know, and um, so, yeah, you know, I'm sympathetic, but. There's there's better ways to help people, all right? Let's work, with, instead of just allowing them all to sneak across the border, all right? Let's, uh, you know, get the government involved and, and, and work with the government to help these other governments get on their feet. And I'm not talking about handing them a bunch of money. I'm talking about help, helping them get things straightened out so that, um, so that, they can, you know, this, this isn't a quick and easy solution. But if a country's having problems, you know, Japan was having problems after World War II. We went in and helped them out. We taught them all kinds of tricks. Problem is, we didn't follow those ideas ourselves, and they ended up passing us up. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we taught them about business and, and how to run a business and, and all that kind of stuff, and they're doing really well now. And so what we need to do is we need to go in and, and help those other countries, too. You know, well, we have. I mean, if you go, you know, into Mexico, there's a lot of factories of American companies there. Um, you know, there's two or three. Uh, you know, we have several auto companies with, with plants there. The problem is, though, you know, it's just not enough for all the people, and this is an opportunity. But you know what we can always do? Help them publish Playboy. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Oh, well, that'll bring in money. Hey, pornography is a, what, billion-dollar industry, you know, or multi-billion dollar? More than that. Yeah, so, multi-billion. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not making any money off it. <laughs> I didn't know you were investing in it. Okay. Yeah, I really wasn't. <laughs> don't really plan on it. Man, that's where the money is, though. So, anyway, um, uh, Playboy magazine, specifically the Mexican, ed- Mexican edition, I was, I, I gotta tell you, I was really reluctant to do this story, but there just weren't a lot of good stories this week. And, uh, so, uh, 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 alright, we'll do it. Alright, um, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> but, uh, 
they they put a model and she's uh she's basically nude she's got this um uh kind of head scarf thing that hangs over her so it covers um you know you can't see anything yeah put it that way but you can tell that she yeah, but this is this is this is a modestly cut picture of it so we keep our clean rating on iTunes so um and I couldn't offend I was afraid of offending Gail's sensibilities so um, but uh, so 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 we edited the picture here. But that this is it. I, now it's 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 it, and on it has uh, something Maria, which happens to be the model's name. Uh, but uh, the way she's dressed um, with the name Maria, obviously supposed to be a reference to the Virgin Mary. And this came out just a two or three days before a Mexican festival about the Virgin Mary. Yeah, the Virgin of Guadalupe, Mexico. Yeah. Where, you know, yeah, the Virgin of Guadalupe is just a huge thing. Our Lady of Guadalupe is a huge thing. Um, now, that's all bad enough. What gets worse is, um, you know, uh, oh, it says, We love you, Maria, in Spanish. That's what it says. And yep. the model's name is Maria Florencia Honori. Anyway, um, yeah, this said, while Playboy Mexico never meant for the cover or images to offend anyone, we recognize that it has created offense, and we, as well as Playboy Mexico, offer our sincerest apology. <laughs> the image is not, and never was intended to portray the Virgin of Guadalupe or any other religious figure. The intent was to reflect a Renaissance-like mood on the cover. Because we all know the Renaissance took place in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they had no idea that, you know, they they took that picture and they put that on the cover, and and no, they didn't expect to offend anybody by that. No, yeah, but it's Leonardo de la, de, de la Renta, you yeah. know, so you know. Yeah. This, yeah, but you know, you you do have to keep in mind that while their, uh, you know, their marketing people said, well, we don't want to offend anybody, but uh, please just keep in mind that uh, if we offend people, this gets a lot of press and it'll sell more copies. You know, you think of all the times that like we had uh, Miss America uh, or you know other people like that um, on the cover, and hmm, yeah, that sold a lot of copies because it generated a lot of controversy and. Uh, you know, let's face it, that industry, controversy is what they're all about. That's well, it's, it's, that's the marketing. That's almost anything. But, I mean, and, and next to the stained glass, I mean, come on, who are they trying yeah. to kid? Yeah, with stained glass. Well, where do you get religious out of stained glass? You know? <sighs> this is sad. This is a, you know... I, I, okay, you know what? Personally, I, number one, I don't mind them insulting Christianity. That's fine. Go right ahead, but be honest about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and you know, poke your thumb, poke your eye, uh, poke, poke your thumb in the eye of Christians. Then at least be honest about it. Yeah, because I mean, your whole industry is doing that, so um, you know it goes against everything that we stand for. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of Christians uh, are use pornography and and purchase pornography and that's really sad and and uh and if you do uh any of you out there uh, please get help uh there's counseling available um it's you're breaking a, you're breaking a commandment it's and you're um you know it's it's it, it treats people like like an object some a, a plaything uh and not a human being that Christ died for um and you're just i mean you're destroying your own personal relationships and um, you know, you think that, remember that that when God created this uh, the the man woman relationship, uh, it was to show us to give us a taste of His love for us. And you know, the way that the devil works best is when he takes a great gift that God has given to us and he corrupts it. And man, all you gotta do is take something that is is just a real blessing from God and twist it just a little bit to make it really, really bad. And the better the gift, the the easier it is to corrupt and the worse it is when it's corrupted. And this is probably the greatest example of that, uh, short of maybe um, salvation itself. 
But there's a, you know, it's just, I don't know. It is. It's sad. You're right. You know, it really is. And uh, uh, I think we've said everything we'd say about this. Yeah, know? let's move on. Hey, yeah, if you're going, if, you, if you're going to insult us, at least be honest, okay? We can handle. We can handle. We can handle honest insults. Uh, just don't try and sit there and say, "Oh no, we didn't mean to do this." Uh, well, as long as we're talking about uh, the Virgin Mary, let's go over and talk about the Vatican. Okay. Uh, you know, you know, and, uh, and uh, here is a little bit more positive story. Um, I guess Overall. in the uh, Vatican uh, issued new things on uh, uh, new guidelines on bioethical issues. Uh, it was called uh, the dignity of the person. Uh, I'll let you, the Latin scholar, pronounce the Latin there. Uh, and it <laughs> I was, was, uh, I was explaining Latin. Doctoral <laughs> office. I, I was explaining Latin to my daughter today. <laughs> She's like, what's Latin? You know, so we were talking about different languages. And, and I said, well, that's the language that they spoke in um, in ancient Rome. And and, and we had just watched um, Nestor the Long Year or Nestor the Long Year Christmas Donkey, which mentioned that this was in the Roman Empire. <laughs> and, uh, and she goes, oh, so it's ancient Rome <laughs> or, or the Roman Empire, Roman Empire language. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so in Roman Empire language, it's uh, dignitas personae. <laughs> she never watched wily cartoon, wily car, coyote cartoons. You know, pa- runzius fastius, yeah. <laughs> pamishus always us. You know, love that book. actually, they're kind of uh, they're kind of famished for Roadrunner cartoons. They haven't seen enough of those. They're just not on as much as they used to be. How are you raising your children? I just don't understand this. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, you know. It's only so many hours in a day. And they have homework, you know. It's called DVD. Why? <laughs> don't worry about the homework, man. Cartoons. <laughs> anyway, back to, back to uh, Dignitas Personae here. Um, uh, um, it took them six years to put it together and was uh, a response to various bioethical issues. Um, uh, you know, again, um, opposed uh, stem cell research if it's devised from embryos, uh, but not from um, uh, uh, adults or umbilical cords or fetuses who died from natural causes. Um, hey, buddy, I'm not paying you to hear your thoughts on life. Uh, their um, opposition to in vitro fertilization, human cloning, genetic testing on embryos before implantation, and embryonic stem cell research. Continues that. Also, it's interesting, I thought it said that um, it bans morning after pill, IUD, and RU486, saying that they, they amount to abortions, and that's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what's interesting is this, that uh, that's, uh, uh, normally it's just, you know, banning contraception. Completely. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of interesting. But and I, know it's interesting say that. I, you know, I didn't. It's a thirty-two page document. I didn't read it, um, and uh, so it may mention something in there that just wasn't mentioned in this article. Although you'd think the Times would mention that because it's kind of controversial. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean, you know, I what I found with, that was interesting about this is that pretty much everything, at least that was covered uh, here uh, in this article. Is stuff that I would agree with the Roman Catholics 100%. Um, you know, really, this is all about respecting human life from the moment of fertilization to um, to the moment of death, and um, and realizing that life is a gift from God, and so and and even if you don't believe in God, realizing that life is is a special, amazing thing, and not and that human beings have intrinsic value. And so we shouldn't go messing with, you know, you know, really when we're talking about embryonic stem cell research, we're talking about taking a human being and splitting that human being up into its component cells and, and using those cells for research, you know, and we're not talking about a dead human being, you know, this is like, there, there was a Monty Python sketch called, um, live organ donor, uh, transplants where the um yeah you, you've got this guy who's who's at home and all of a sudden some of these uh 
uh, doctors or, or whatever they are walk into the, the house and uh, start basically trying to dissect the guy. Oh, well, you're an organ donor. We need that organ now, you know, and, and uh, there's it was, it was blood everywhere. It's, it's kind of gruesome. But, you know, I, I look at that and then I look at this and, you know, when you're talking about, um, oh, well, you, you know, in this case, the, the babies didn't even have a chance to fill out the organ donor card, you know. Um, they didn't even have organs yet. And, uh, and they're already being dissected to help other people. And I'm sorry, that's just I, wrong. Uh, does not take his kids to watch Wiley Coyote cartoons, but they watch Monty Python. My kids don't watch Monty Python. <laughs> so, uh, I liked uh, the other thing here. It says, um, I thought it was kind of neat. Uh, at the end of it, uh, the, the Archbishop Luis Francisco Lardiera Ferrer, a Jesuit, and he said the document would probably be accused of containing too many bans, but he said the church felt the duty to give a voice to those who have no voice. Yeah. And I thought that was a really neat statement. Because, you know, some people wonder, you know, why is it, you know, this, this kind of thing gets to be an issue for us? And it really is because we're trying to give voice to those who have no voice. Yeah, if we don't speak up to forum, who will? No one. Absolutely no one. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to pick up the other end. It's already happening. That you come to the end of your life and people are going, why are we keeping you around? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you're just wasting too much time. So just want, want to just go ahead and get you, uh, get rid of you and move on in life. Yeah. Yeah. Or, it's just, yeah, you know, I mean, we're talking about human beings, you know, we're talking about moms and dads and, or we're talking about little babies, you know, and, um, you know, you can look at this a million different ways. You know, people say, well, you know, this could be the next Einstein that we're killing or the next Gandhi or, you know, or whatever. And, um, well, yeah, maybe. But you know what? This person doesn't have to have some sort of potential for accomplishing some world-changing thing to have value, right? You're valuable just because you're a human being. Well, interesting enough, I, uh, <laughs> um, I kind of used that argument in the paper one time, you know, who knows what this child's capable of or who knows what this child will do. And I really, I hit the editor really where it hurts because said, you know, who knows? It could be a Larry, a guy's name was Larry McRonald. I said, who knows? It could be another Larry. It could be Larry McRonald's. Somehow or another, when they publish it, that, that remark it got edited out. <laughs> Imagine that. Our local paper yeah, won't let us publish any, uh, it, we, we can, we do this sort of rotating, they call it a capsule sermon, or do a little devotional thought. We're not allowed to do, to discuss anything controversial in it, though. Our evangelical free pastor, uh, local one, he actually uh, bowed out because he did this one on abortion, caused all kinds of problems and stuff, and they said, you can't do that anymore. He said, then forget it. I'm not going to do it anymore. But um, I still do it. I I'm just more subtle about it. I still have plenty of controversial stuff in it, but... I think people just don't get it, or at least the editor didn't get it. So, but uh, we're talking, we're you know, we're talking about human life. Um, one of the interesting things they spent a little time on in the article was uh, freezing embryos. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, what it, you have these uh, basically if if you're doing a um, uh, in vitro fertilizations where this is usually done, uh, where you take a number of eggs out of the mother, you, um, you, you fertilize them in a, you know, test tube or whatever. And, um, with the father sperm, and then you take what, two or three of them usually and implant them in the mother and you put the rest of them, you freeze them. So that if it doesn't work, you've got more to, to use. Well then, okay, well, if it works, what do you do with the other ones? Oh, well, you know, it costs like, what, $30,000, something like that, to go through this process. So I can't really afford to do it again. Got the kid that I wanted. So what do you do with all those? Those are human beings frozen in, you know, ice cubes, basically. Yeah, we're in trouble. Um, and and uh, a lot of time, well, where do you think the um, stem cells embryos come from? Right. Right there. But they're still human beings. 
You know, they're just not implanted in a mother yet. Now, there, there's been some talk about uh, they call it prenatal adoption, uh, where someone <laughs> can actually adopt one of these, have it implanted, and you know, so they're actually adopting this baby before it's, you know, even and, and actually carrying it to term. And and it's um, you know so, but then the the document says, well, you know, it's it's praiseworthy. But there's some ethical problems because uh, you're talking about surrogate motherhood, and the church prohibits that. And yeah, that's I don't know. I tend to, except for on the birth control issue, I, I tend to kind of lean with. I, I just think anytime you 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 know you open these cans of worms and then you you open the barn doors, it's pretty hard to get them shut. And um, you know we're we've. I've mentioned this one before, all right? It's my favorite line from Jurassic Park. You were so concerned about whether you could do it, you never stopped to ask whether you should. You know, our our technology, our knowledge is moving faster than our wisdom can. And uh, we're, you know, we're so busy on trying to figure out what we can accomplish. We don't stop and think about, is this really something that we should be doing? Or, you know, maybe we should think about what are the long-term effects of this or, or, you know, what are the ethical approaches to this process and what's not ethical? What should we just avoid out of just plain doing the right thing? And, um, you know, it's, you, you don't make money making ethical decisions. You know, it, it, it really is somewhat, so often comes back to money, prestige, you know, you don't make press, you know, how much, how many, uh, professors out there have you heard of that, um, that have really been noteworthy because they were, um, they were moving down the road to some discovery, then realized that, wait a minute, this is going to cause a huge ethical problem. We can't do this and stopped. All right. How many of them have been, you know, written up in, in journals and, and, uh, appeared in, uh, you know, in the news and, and all that kind of stuff. Nobody. They get fired and forgotten. You know, if there's any out there, I'm sure there's some out there. I, I, I really, I've got to believe that there are some out there that, um, you know, that have, have found themselves in that situation and done the right thing. But, um, ah, you know, so, it gets messy. It get, does get messy. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, let's see. Well, we got a couple of Christmas stories. Um, let's deal with the really stupid one first. <laughs> Our friends at the Westboro Baptist Church, all 20 of them in that congregation. <laughs> now, the poor um, Olympia, Washington. Okay, they started off, you know, having this crush, and then, you know, then the atheists showed up, and we talked about them last week. You yep. know, it was all a myth. It was all stupidity. And um, so somebody else wanted to sign up there, um, you know, uh, um, wanting a, a thing for the um, uh, uh, a Festivus poll. And then the, the, it's been a request for our favorite uh, display of the uh, flying spaghetti monster. And, um, you know... Uh, then, then, then there's one, a very surprising show of normalcy, a sign from a Christian woman in Bellevue who wants to offer blessings on all people. And then there is the Westboro Baptist Church. Should we sing it? Um, <laughs> yeah, you better watch out. Get ready to cry. You better go hide, and I'm telling you why. So Santa Claus will take you to hell. He's your favorite idol. You worship at his feet. But when you stand before God, he won't help you take the heat. So get this fact straight. You're feeling God's hate. Satan's to blame for the economy's fate. Santa's to blame for the economy's fate. Santa Claus will take you to hell. Just, you know, isn't that catchy? <laughs> Tis the season, you know, peace and joy and, you know, love and... Hell and <laughs> oh, see, there's another song that is popping into my head as as uh, as, as you're going through this, 
And uh, my favorite version of it is the original uh, by Boris Karloff. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. <laughs> this is just... I, actually, it was not by Boris Karloff. Boris Karloff did not sing that song. He did the voices, but he did not sing the song. The song was sung, and I can't remember the guy's name. He did the voice for Tony the Tiger. Oh, you're right. I remember hearing that. He just died not all that long ago. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's who did the singing. But be all that. It, um, this is stupid. This is absolutely stupid. Um, you know, I, and I, I understand. I mean, I've, you know, I've had debates with some parents, you know, should I have the Santa Claus in my house? Yada, yada, yada. You know, and I've always was one of the kids who have Santa Claus kneeling at the manger. You know, and I know, I've, you know, know some Lutheran pastors, you know, oh no, we celebrate the, you know, St. Nicholas in our house, you know, and, we talk about him on December the 6th, yada, yada, yada. I get, I get it all, okay? But, you know, I mean, it's interesting, I mean, cause, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 Santa Claus is, Saint, you know, does, is Dutch for St. Nicholas. Uh, Chris Kringle is Christ Child. Um, so, you know, there's all this stuff you can do. For, and, you know, there, there, there's some fantasy and some whimsy. You know, it was interesting to me growing up, because I remember reading, you know, believing in Santa Claus, on one hand. But on the other hand, you know, reading about traditions across the world. You know? And, you know, that, you know, in some land, you know, they, they put out, the kids would put out shoes for the, the, the wise men to put uh, candy in as they went on their journey by. And, and other traditions, you know? Which somehow never, never conflicted on this with me. I remember seeing this movie, and maybe somebody out there can can help me um, with this because I, I had, the only thing I remember about the movie, and I don't remember the title, and I wish I did. Um, this girl like goes to to um, uh, North Pole and meets Santa, and that, and he's talking about these different traditions, and he's got these like it's like a like a paper doll like a piece of paper with a kind of a cutout of a costume and he walks through this paper and all of a sudden he's wearing the different costume for the different and he's talking about the different countries where he wears different costumes for different countries and i have this image in my head it, it was really cool and and so that's how i always oh, looked at it there's all these different things but there's just one santa is that like there's all these different <laughs> names for God, but just the same God. <laughs> there you go. It's universalism. <laughs> right, oh, man. You, man, you better not let the last girl back to church know that, man. Then they're, 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 you know, I'm going to be talking about universalism, too. Um, See, this reminds I mean, me of the old, uh, wasn't it Dana Carvey? Did the church? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the church lady. Um, he's Lutheran, by the way. And, uh, you know, the, there was this bit, and in fact, we just saw it on TV um, on a Greatest Holiday uh, Scenes show or something like that, and uh, where he does the, he's got Santa, you know, written across the thing, he goes, hmm, wonder where this comes from? Hmm, could it be, and it rearranges the letters, Satan? <laughs> this is classic. I don't know. To me, this is just, I don't know. It's nonsense. I think it's kind of interesting that uh, this com- comment by the um, Catholic League president, Bill Donahue, you know, was, uh, you know, having first acceded to request of the atheist to attack Christmas, she's now confronted with the likes of Westboro Baptist Church, a viciously anti-American, anti-Catholic, and anti-gay group. You know, there is a real way to deal with the situation that is legally acceptable and morally defensible. But neither the Washington governor nor her lawyers figured it out. Governor Gregory should have allowed the atheist group to display its sign in a different location or at a different time, but not directly next to the nativity scene at Christmas. Has she done so, she'll be able to treat the Westboro Baptist bigots the same way. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and and that's from, coming from the uh, Catholic League of Religious and Civil Rights. Yeah. This. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, this is. Uh, well, I, I think you know you you you. Okay, 
I mean, here she's. I thought putting up the the um, uh, um, the, the statement by the Freedom from Religious Foundation. Um, okay, you know, because we, we wanted, you know, it, it's 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 a foundation at least group I've at least heard of. Uh, it's got more, you know, it's got a, a constituency out there, especially in Washington State, where there are a lot of non-Christians. Okay, I understand that. How many followers and members are there of the Westboro Baptist Church out there? In Washington? How many? Yeah, you know, which is, you know, in Topeka, Kansas. Um, you know, or uh, how many people, uh, or a couple of the other ones there that, you know, want to put things up. Um, I just think this kind of stuff is kind of silly and foolish and um you know they're, they're they're going overboard and and maybe they i mean of course this, this is a group i'm very upset with because they you know uh, uh protested uh, uh the death of uh, of, of soldiers you know defending their, their you know who are fighting their battle by fighting their wars um they're just a nasty group of people <laughs> And uh, I have no sympathy for them at all. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is that it really irritates me that they use, um, that they they get lumped in with Christians because they really give Christians a bad name. You know, though, I think, I think a lot of people realize that there are reasonable people. And there are whack jobs. I mean, if, if, although, I mean, you know, Rick Warren was invited to give Obama's inaugural opening prayer, and, you know, all these people were up in arms about that. Obviously, you know, they couldn't see the difference between a, you know, a moderate evangelical and a whack job. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, some of those, you know, you had to wonder about their sanity, too. So, uh, uh, um, but, you know, I would think, you know, you can see something between, you know, okay, um, you know, even I'll stand up and say, you know, the, 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 the Christian, the Catholic League there is, uh, not exactly a, you know, liberal organization. It's pretty conservative overall. Um, and Bill Donahue is, you know, it's a very conservative group. But even he, you know, sees the difference between, <laughs> you know, where most Christian groups are and the whack jobs at, at Westboro. Yeah. And, uh, but, the only thing they are good at is, is getting headlines because we've managed to talk about them two or three different times, um, and they're just good at doing that. They're just, you know, uh, you know. Fred Phelps, this is a personal message to you. There's very little difference between you and the Virgin Mary Playboy, Playboy cover. Both there just to get a story. Yep. Yep, and neither one has anything to do with the gospel. That's right. Uh, matter of fact, I've, uh, you know, used, uh, 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 well, like I said, you know, one of my favorite little things parent made me was, you know, the statue of Jesus kneeling at, at Santa Claus, uh, uh, kneeling before the manger. And, uh, you know, and I've often talked about that and stuff. And interesting enough is that the manger doesn't want to stay on there. It, uh, for some reason, it just doesn't want to stay glued. <laughs> and, uh, so, I used that for a sermon many years ago. It was, um, Take away the manger, and all you have is Santa Claus. <laughs> so that's cool. the name of that yeah. sermon. That was that was a great little um, you know, object to use and stuff. And but I talked about the importance that you know really is about Jesus. And I think you can you know teach kids that. You know, I, this morning we had a great kids program uh, at our church. Uh, and uh, you know the kids just really shared. And not only did we. Uh, we started at creation. We talked about the fall, and then we uh, got in the Christmas story. Then we got in the prophecies of Christ. We got in the Christmas story, and we ended up at the, the empty tomb. Cool. Uh, with the angels, yeah, with uh, uh, with, with God's greatest Christmas present, the resurrection. So uh, that was kind of a neat, neat way of going about it. Oh, speaking of Christmas. Uh, um, Yes. We're, we're not going to have an episode next week. I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I don't want to forget this. Um, we're not going to have an episode next week uh, because of Christmas. Um, and um, 
I don't think we are. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm going to on Christmas Day. I'm doing a um, a monologue, kind of along the same lines as uh, what I did for Easter Sunrise, um, and I I added it to our our feed then, and I'm going to do it this time too. So, uh, not sure when I'll actually get it all imported and everything, because um, you know we're going to be uh, spending time with family and stuff after Christmas and that, but uh, should be sometime between Christmas and New Year anyway. Uh, we'll get that added, and uh, so you can look forward to that. Okay. And let's end then with the Christmas story. <laughs> with the great question of, when was Jesus born anyway? <laughs> All we know for sure is that it wasn't December 25th. <laughs> At least we hope not. Um, although, you know, I mean, there's that beautiful German carol, Still, still, still with the sound of the little snowflakes coming and stuff. And there, there's a few other, there's a few other, uh, great carols out there talks about, uh, 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 was it the, the first Noel on a winter's night that was so deep? Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of, you know, great, uh, uh, carols, even good Christian carols that, that talk about it being in winter, even though it wasn't. Yeah. But some, uh, in the like, I, 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 yeah, some astronomers down in Australia, uh, <clears throat> have charted the night sky 2,000 years ago, and they believe the star of Bethlehem was conjunction of Venus and Jupiter, which took place on June 17th in the year 2 BC. I got a bad feeling about this. So, um, reasonable, you know, here's the thing. We don't really know what the star of Bethlehem was. I've heard all kinds of different theories. Uh, This is two planets, um, in conjunction, um, I heard three that, uh, another time that it was Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn, I think. Saturn. Yeah. There yeah. is one major, big old, huge old problem with the date that they have given. <laughs> Herod's been dead for two years. Hmm. <laughs> Herod the Great died in 4 BC, so Jesus had to, li- to be born before the year 4 BC. Yeah, because he was like a year old when Herod the Great did the killing all the babies. Right, or at least he was something old. I mean, yeah. I don't know how old it could have been a couple months. We that we don't know. I mean, you know, Herod was the kind of guy who was going to be, you know, Mc sure. You know, I mean, this guy who killed his son, you know, I'm surprised he didn't kill, you know, go for the cousins, grandkids, yeah, everything else to get a hold of, you know, you know, third cousins twice removed. I mean, so he, he was that type of guy, so, uh, but, uh, Herod died in the year 4 BC, so, anytime you want to put Jesus' birth, it has to be before the death of Herod. That's, that's the only problem that I, I have here, uh, with their theory. Uh, in, around the year 4 to 5 BC, yeah, there was a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn very close to each other. That only happens once 800 years. And so, uh, there, that's, uh, if you ever see, uh, talk to, uh, read Paul Meyer's book, The First Christmas. That's, that's his belief. Isn't that what the movie, or no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm getting those two confused. You're right, Paul Meyer's book. I was thinking the, I, I read, I saw the movie, The Nativity Story. And read Paul Meyer's book about the same time. <laughs> so, sometimes to get the, the two of them mixed up. So, yeah, you're right. Um, and, uh, so that, you know, and here's the thing. All right. Since we're talking about the star, all right. Um, I always go through this with my confirmation kids at Christmas time. And that is that the wise men, and we also, in our Christmas program, we never have wise men. <laughs> and, uh, because we do Christmas, not Epiphany. And uh, I'm kind of ornery about that. If we ever did add the wise men, we would make a point of emphasizing that it, you know, that they're not there at the stable. Um, but because the wise men were not there, you know, even though in, in all of the, uh, all, all the cartoons and the artwork and, and everything, and, you know, we've been watching a lot of Rankin Bass uh, all those classic Christmas specials. I mentioned Nestor and, uh, you've got, uh, 
uh, the little drummer boy and little drummer boy book two and, and stuff. And you always have the wise men there showing up, uh, at the, at the manger and, and, uh, no, nope, no, nope, that's, that's not how it happens. Matthew says they were in a house when the wise men got there. Now here's the problem with it. The star being just some sort of planetary conjunction though. It says that, you know, they, when they got to Bethlehem, now, first of all, they followed the star. And apparently it must have like disappeared because they get to Israel and they didn't know where to go. And so they went to Jerusalem because, hey, we're looking for a king. Jerusalem's the capital. That's where you look for a king. All right. And so then they um, they found out from the uh, religious scholars, oh, no, this is uh, um, it's the, the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. So you should look there. And so they, they head out toward Bethlehem and then they see the star and they rejoiced. When they saw the star. So that means the star reappeared. So whether it had been cloudy um, or more likely there were two different events that happened uh, within a, a short period of time, one of which sort of got the ball rolling and the second one um, was. But, you know, the other thing is the star rested above the house. And, uh, you know, what does that mean? Because I sorry, if I see a star up in the sky, I'd never go, oh, that's right over such and such's house. You know, it's like it's out there, you know, and, and it doesn't, it never looks like it's right over somebody's house. And so what was that? But you're not a wise that? man either. <laughs> this is true. Nobody would argue with you on that one. <laughs> so, you know, um, by the way, the one who said it was uh, Jupiter and Saturn was Johannes Kepler. And he was the one who made that, who first uh, came up with that, and uh, because the uh, conjunction took place in his lifetime, and uh, then he figured uh, figured out it was once every eight hundred years, and so uh, traced it back. Yeah, so he traced it back, and I can't remember when it was the last. Well, I guess it was uh, Kepler uh, in the seventeen hundreds, and so you know we're not going to be around to see it again. So no. You know, uh, so anyway. You know, who knows what it was? Um, I thought they had an interesting theory. Uh, it looked really good, and then it dawned on me uh, the year is wrong. Uh, so uh, whatever it is, it happened the year before that. Um, there are Chinese records of um, <coughs> of comets taking place around that time, but comets were generally considered bad signs. Um, <coughs> no, no, no records of like a nova or supernova, which would be interesting if that happened. Because, um, um, you know, because of the speed of light, actually, you know, it, it exploded some other time. Uh, the light just traveling to Earth now, which, you know, how that would have worked in that God would have, um, you know, had the star explode just at the right time so that the, the light would travel at the right time. Um, you know, it says something about the way God had planned the whole thing to begin with. Well, we know he planned the whole thing to begin with. And we know that he had the time nailed down exactly. So, yeah, so, but it, it's always kind of fun to me to speculate. And this is this this is a kind of a fun story to end on, I think tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you have theories about what caused the star. I had one person just get very upset when I talk this kind of stuff. Inform me that this is just a supernatural event that you can't really explain and you shouldn't even try. Okay. So, <laughs> maybe you have a good explanation. You can always contact us at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Uh, maybe you're really happy we're not going to be here next week for Christmas. You can let us know that at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Or chances are, if that's what you have to tell us, you can just leave a comment on YouTube. Because <laughs> realistically, that's probably where you're watching this. <clears throat> or yeah. maybe you know you think Gail's the wise man and I'm not. You can tell us that. You know you can you, you know go to our our, our web page and you can leave that comment there. You know <laughs> or either one of us are wise men. Uh, so um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. No, so we, we haven't gotten any feedback. We always like feedback and things like that. And uh, but we do thank you. You know both of you for listening to us. It does mean a lot. Yep. And. Uh, and so, with I'd that, like to... Dale, I pray God would give you a blessed Christmas. 
out there in Iowa. I pray that uh, he be with you as um, you share his word. Uh, actually, as you celebrate both Christmases, because Dale's uh, their Christmas pageant got canceled today, so they're going to do be doing their their Christmas pageant with the kids next Sunday. Yep, yeah, Sunday morning okay. instead of service. <laughs> and I'll tell you, it's a it's a program. It's it's definitely not a you know a service. Uh, yeah, we've got like six scene changes, and um, where the apparently we've got this guy that's rigged up some. I don't know how he's doing it because I haven't even seen it yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and but it's there's gonna be like actual changes of scenery and stuff like that. And we're doing this all in sanctuary, so it's gonna be interesting. Um, curious how it's all gonna pan out, and <laughs> just hoping that it pans out, especially since the kids aren't gonna have a chance to practice <laughs> again <laughs> before doing it. So. Well, ours we did this morning, and ours was the setting of a Sunday school that was rehearsing your Sunday school program, and um, <clears throat> and then it's interrupted by this kid who's outside uh, skateboarding and looking for the bathroom, and it's like, uh, so what's this all about? I, I don't, I've never been in church before, so they say, well, why don't you sit here and we'll walk you through it, and uh, you can ask questions as you go along. So you know, it talks about Mary. He says, How old is Mary? Eh, about fifteen. You mean God's mother was an unmarried pregnant teenager? Isn't that illegal or something? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds cool. Where did you guys get that curriculum? Or the I wrote it. Program? Oh, you wrote it. <laughs> yeah, I wrote it. Okay. And uh, so uh, it's. Uh, I originally called it Get Out, but some other church used it and called it The Passion in the Pageant. So I thought that was a much better title. So I. I appropriated their title uh anybody who'd be interested in new looking at it next year by the way please don't feel free to email me at uh, podcast at crossfeednews.com i'm glad to send it out to you for free and um just i just ask if you do use it that in the, the program uh in, in, in there that you you know put me give me a credit line yep that way they know who to blame I mean. that's right and uh, but uh, so it, it, it's a it's a uh, it's a fun little thing and uh, um, <clears throat> it, it, it's a it's a <clears throat> and then we ended with um, uh, yeah we actually have a short homily I have a short homily it took about twenty five thirty five minutes for it and then I had a fifteen ten fifteen minute homily and, uh, and ended the service that way so cool yeah I've got one of those at the end. It's like the little slot pastor's message. So, and I've got that figured out too. So, good, good. But really, uh, do pray for you to have a blessed Christmas out there in Iowa. Thanks, you too. And everybody that's watching and listening, have a very blessed Christmas. Remember that this is the time that while we celebrate gift giving and all that kind of stuff, uh, first one, I'm going to say, don't go around telling people, Merry Christmas, you know, like, like you better say Merry Christmas. All right. Just, Oh, celebrate the joy and, and don't be in your face about it. But just remember that we do have something to celebrate, that God became flesh to, to live among us, to take our sin on him, and to, um, to, to take that sin all the way to the cross so that, uh, as Jim mentioned before, we end up at the empty tomb, uh, not only Christ's tomb being empty, but all of ours one day. And so we look mm-hmm. forward to that. And that's what we celebrate yeah. this season. I also wish you all a blessed Christmas out there in podcast land. And uh, take care, and God be with you. Good night, everybody. God bless you.